Now the format we have here is I'm going to start out with a couple of questions, but then we're going to quickly go to the audience to get questions. And we have a diversified audience out here. My guess is that some of the bankers in the audience could go into levels of details of questions that perhaps some of the rest of us may not understand. So I want to make sure that we get sort of a level set on who is the Federal Reserve and why does it matter, why does it affect you, why are you here to be in Grand Forks, and so if you could just give us a sort of primer on the organization that you lead. Sure, so first of all, Mark, thank you, and to all of you, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules. Uh, this is my second visit to North Dakota, and so far North Dakotans are wonderful hosts, so I really appreciate the hospitality you've shown me. So the Federal Reserve is our nation's central bank. Congress created us through an, uh, a law, an act of Congress in 1913, the Federal Reserve Act, and the President signed it, and our job overall, our job is to try to manage some of the ups and downs of the economy. So Congress has given us what we call a dual mandate. That means what we call stable prices, so the economy is not overheating, but not growing too slowly, and maximum employment. As many Americans who want to work are able to find a job. We're the nation's central bank managing those ups and downs. Now, if you go back in American history, our country always hated the idea of having a central bank. Alexander Hamilton actually created the first central bank. It lasted a few decades, they got rid of it, they tried it again, they got rid of it. They hated the idea of having a central bank because it all sounded very undemocratic. A bunch of bankers in a dark room doing God knows what, it doesn't sound very good. But then our country was hammered with financial crises in the late 1800s, including a really big one, the banking panic of 1907. And then Congress said, well, I guess, even though we don't like it, I guess we need to have a central bank. But if we're going to have one, we don't want it all concentrated in Washington, D.C. or New York. So they did something unique. They created a diversified central bank distributed around the country with 12 regional Federal Reserve banks, including the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. So our job at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is to represent all of you, to get to know what's happening in the economy in Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, part of Michigan, and part of Wisconsin, and be able to bring that local knowledge back to Washington, D.C. when we set monetary policy for the nation. So the reason that I'm here is to hear directly from you what's happening in the local economy, what's happening in the local job market, to make me smarter so that when I go back to Washington, D.C., I can bring this knowledge back to Washington. So it's really important that I, I hear from you. That's why I'm grateful that you're here. So thank you. And so just to summarize it, with that dual mandate of employment as well as inflation, uh, you have a big impact on whether these young graduates get a job because you're focused on making sure jobs are out there and what you're paying for whatever you're buying is the two things that you're focused on. Now, you mentioned there the, the resistance because it's not really politically controlled. Over the decades, over the centuries now, most countries have found it important to have the Federal Reserve be independent, meaning not controlled by the politicians directly. Why is that? Why is it proven to be important? Why is that the right path to take for a central bank? Yeah, Mark, you're exactly right. That's been proven to be critical to central bank effectiveness, is that it not be under the control, direct decision making by either Congress or the executive branch. Because the, the temptation is, and history has shown it, politicians will often try to please their constituents. And sometimes the Fed has to do things that are unpopular, like cool the economy down if it looks like it's going to overheat. Well, that can mean it's harder for people to get jobs if we're tapping the brakes. And so the temptation is the politicians will say, well, just keep your foot on the gas because it's going to be good for my voters. But then if that leads to high inflation, it ends up hurting everybody in the long term. So that independence of partisan politics is actually critical to the Federal Reserve and all central banks being effective. And I'll, I'll give you an example when it broke down. It broke down in the 60s and the 70s, and then what ended up happening? Your students aren't going to remember this, but the professors and the bankers will. We had very, very, very high inflation in the late 70s and the early 80s, and that was a direct result of the Fed compromising its independence. The good news is, since then, Republicans and Democrats have come together and said, let's keep the Fed independent. Let's let the Fed focus on the data and leave the politics to the White House and to the Congress. And that's the line that we try to adhere to. Now, uh, you're important as the, one of the 12 presidents of the 12 
banks within the Federal Reserve doing the regulatory, the operations, but there is a portion of those 12 presidents that are on what they call the Federal Open Market Committee, which those that follow the stock market, every time they meet, there's all speculation ahead of time and speculation as to what's happening. Uh, so that puts you in an even more important role today. Just give us a primer on the Federal Open Markets Committee, what its objectives is, and again, why that is important. Sure. So there are seven governors of the Federal Reserve System, including the chair, Janet Yellen, who you mentioned is the, one of the top most powerful people in the world, and then 12 Reserve Bank presidents, so up to 19 participants total. And then the, the presidents rotate on when we vote. So I'm a voter this year. I won't be a voter for the next two years. And it's just the system that Congress created. So we all meet, all of us, every six weeks in Washington to debate the economy, the outlook, what we think the recommendation is should be for interest rates. And then at the end of the meeting, we take a vote. And this year, we have raised interest rates twice, in March and in June. And I was the only person in the room voting against those interest rate increases. Because when I look at the economy, I don't see any signs that the economy is close to overheating. I don't see inflation taking off, so I see no need to tap the brakes. But it's a vote. And when one person is voting no and the rest are voting yes, we raise rates, uh, despite my best arguments against. And so part of what you're doing when you're coming here to Grand Forks, you're meeting with Grand Sky, you're going to be meeting with American Crystal tomorrow, you're going to be meeting with a few of our engineering students, you're taking a pulse, asking folks, getting their input, just so that when you're sitting there voting, do I do things like raise interest rates or not? Uh, you have some input that's to try to moderate the employment and the inflation rate in the way that we've talked about. Now, part of what we've all been through is uh, quite a dramatic experience in the financial crisis that led to an economic slowdown. And the Fed took some extraordinary measures that it perhaps never taken before and has built a bigger balance sheet than it's ever had before. And you've been advocating that we should perhaps start to unwind some of that, that balance sheet. Getting that right, if you college students are figuring out what is the top 10 things that are going to determine whether you have a good early career coming out of college, how well the Fed unwinds that balance sheet, I would suggest to you is one of the 10 most important things in your future. So, so help us understand why. No pressure. Why, no pressure. <laughs> why? why this is important, why you're advocating, sure. what the Fed is considering doing. Help them understand why this 10 most important things in their immediate future sure. is going to be managed right. So um, let me tell you about what, this is what, what Mark is referring to, is what we call quantitative easing. So during the financial crisis, the Federal Reserve cut interest rates to zero. But then the question was, is the Fed out of ammunition to continue stimulating the economy? So the interest rates that we move up, up and down regularly, are what are overnight interest rates. So the interest rates that banks lend to each other just literally for one day. Now, if you take out a loan to buy a house or you're a business taking out a loan to build a factory, you don't really care about overnight interest rates. You care about interest rates over the next five and 10 years. And so once we drove overnight interest rates down to zero, the Fed started to buy long-term bonds to drive long-term interest rates down to try to stimulate the economy by lowering borrowing costs. So if you're a factory, or you're a business, and you want to build a factory, instead of taking a loan out at a 5% rate, if you can take a loan out at a 4% rate, it makes it more economic for you to go build that factory and hire those people. So that's how we try to stimulate the economy. So in doing so, the Federal Reserve expanded its balance sheet to $4.5 trillion by buying US Treasury bonds and mortgage-backed securities. So now we have this giant stock of assets and we want to gradually shrink them back down. Well, actually, last week in our meeting, we voted to start the process of shrinking that balance sheet back down to normal size. And we're going to do that by letting those bonds mature. So think of it this way. If you, any of you, buys a treasury bond from the US government, let's say a five-year bond, after year five, you're going to get a check from the Treasury Department because that bond is going to mature. That's what we're going to do. We're going to allow these, these bonds to mature and gradually shrink that balance sheet back down to a normal size. And I think we have, under Janet Yellen's leadership, done a very good job communicating to the markets exactly how that's going to take place so that we don't surprise people, so that we don't create any unnecessary anxiety. So I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll meet the uh, objective that you set so that your students can uh, get good jobs when they graduate. 
we're, uh, we'll maintain that optimism <laughs> as well. I'm going to open it up for questions. I can go on the, the whole program here. But do we have uh, somebody with a mic that they can bring to questions? Uh, please over raise here. your hand, and they'll bring it over to you. So we have a couple of mics around the room. Uh, any questions? There's one we back one there. way in the, in the back here. We could pass it down across the aisle. And the uh, rest of you, uh, be thinking of your questions, and I'll fill in the gaps to the extent we have slow. Do you see Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as a threat to the current monetary system put forth by the Federal Reserve? Uh, I don't. So the question is about things like Bitcoin and some of these alternative currencies, these virtual currencies. You know, the big selling point when these things came out was that you could never have runaway inflation because you, you're fixing by design the number of Bitcoins that are ever going to be created. So you never have to worry about runaway inflation. Uh, the way I mentioned, if the Federal Reserve was compromised, its independence, you could have high inflation. That's a fine theory, but the problem is the barrier to entry of creating new cryptocurrencies is very low. So Bitcoin is one, Ethereum is another. Tomorrow, Mark can create Markcoin, and I can create Neilcoin. And then all of a sudden, you have a proliferation of competing virtual currencies. So actually, in American history, each state had their own currency. You had Virginia, you had New York, you had Massachusetts, and you had runaway inflation. Nobody that I've seen has come up with a, a, a way to prevent this from happening. And so to me, I mean, we'll see if Bitcoin lasts, if it's a bubble or not. We're paying attention to it. I don't see it as a credible competitor to the dollar because there's only one dollar. It's a monopoly that's been created by the United States government with the full backing of the US government. Bitcoin can compete against that. Question over here. Uh, Mr. Kashkari, um, thank you for being here. Uh, could you maybe explain to everyone in here what your involvement was with TARP? And if you, at this point, 10 years later, maybe think it didn't pan out like you hoped it would? And what lessons do you think uh, you take away from that experience? Um, so during the financial crisis, actually before the financial crisis, I was uh, at the US Treasury Department. and. During the financial crisis, I ran the Troubled Asset Relief Program, the TARP program, the, the big bailout that everybody hated. Uh, you know, my old boss, Hank Paulson, likes to joke that 60% of Americans are against torture, you know, waterboarding, things like that. 90% were against the TARP. And, <laughs> and I was the guy in charge of that program. So you learn to have a very thick skin. We hated that we had to bail out the banks. Absolutely hated it. But it was absolutely the right thing to do. Because if we had allowed the major banks in America to all collapse, we would have been in a Great Depression scenario looking at 25% unemployment instead of a Great Recession scenario, which was 10% unemployment. So it was the right thing to do. Uh, the collective actions of the Fed and Treasury and Congress worked. We stabilized this terrible crisis. But we never want to have to do it again. And that's why one of the first things I did coming to the Minneapolis Fed was work with our colleagues to come up with a plan to make sure the biggest banks in America never destabilize the US economy again. We call it the Minneapolis plan, and it basically will force the biggest banks in America to have a lot more capital to protect taxpayers when they run into trouble. Banks will make mistakes again. We don't want to make, put the taxpayers on the hook in the future. And one of the leadership lessons you'll find, not necessarily passing opinions on TARP or not, but uh, you're probably not a leader if you don't do something in your life that isn't unpopular with 90% of the people. Uh, that's just a, a general rule that I found. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Inflation has been running below the Fed's target rate of 2%, although coming up. Uh, would you? It's actually going down. Oh, well, from months. where, from <laughs> the Nader where it was before. But w w would you like to discuss that because certainly the uh, keeping uh, inflation within control is good, but if there's anything worse than high inflation, it's no inflation. Could you just sure. discuss that a little bit, So please? people often ask me, why does the Fed have a 2% inflation target and not zero? And it's a good question. And the reason is, is because deflation or falling prices is devastating for a society, right? If you have a student loan or you have a mortgage on your house and prices in the economy start falling, the, the effective size of your debt just goes up and up and up. And so deflation is a very bad, vicious spiral that can be created. So we have a 2% inflation target, which is a little bit above zero, to make sure we never fall into that deflationary spiral. Consider margin for error. 
And it's actually proven in the last few years, it's a darn good thing we have that margin because we have failed so far to hit our inflation target of 2%. We've been coming up short around one and a half, 1.6%. So if we actually had a target of zero and we were coming up short, we would be in that bad outcome of deflation. Now this is a conundrum. We don't exactly know why inflation has been so low. The way we think it's supposed to work, as the job market heats up, employers have to compete for workers. And then they start bidding against each other, driving wages up. And then they pass those costs onto their customers, and that drives inflation up. Well, we've seen the job market in America and in North Dakota get a lot stronger over the last 10 years. A peak unemployment rate of 10% fall into 4.4%. And yet wage growth has been very limited and inflation has been very limited and we're not exactly sure why. My best assessment is that there's more slack, there are more unemployed people out there that are not counted in the national statistics and people's expectations for inflation have been drifting lower. That's a complicated topic, but both of those feeding together I think are leading to low inflation, which tells me the Fed should be under no pressure to raise rates we have time to let inflation climb back to target. Just to stretch your minds, we're waiting for the next question to happen and people will bring a mic to you, is uh, one of our other speakers at the Economic Club was uh, Kuroda, the head of the Japanese Central Bank, uh, who is on that list of most powerful people. But he's been having to have negative inf interest rates for the last several years. So if you can think of a negative interest rates, you're getting uh, what do we learn from that? And that's, that, that is dealing with, they've gone over the line to that deflation. Why is that deflation so bad? Has Kuroda been effective in dealing with it in Japan? And, and how does that, what lessons does that give to us? Well, it, it teaches us to be very cautious that once you're into a deflationary zone, it can be very hard to get out of. And it's not just up to the central bank. It's also looking at what's happening in the broader economy and the population. So. Demographics, it turns out, matters a lot. So our population is aging. We're not having kids at the same rate that we used to. And one source of economic growth is simply population growth. Well, if we're having fewer babies and we're just having smaller population growth, our economy is probably going to grow more slowly. That's true in America. It's even more true in Japan. And so I feel for Kuroda because he's trying to use monetary policy to solve fundamental structural economic problems, which really can't be solved with monetary policy. So for all of us, there are, there are a lot of lessons in here. Number one, the Federal Reserve must not allow deflation to take hold. Number two, we need to be honest with each other about our own demographic challenges. And one of the things that I've been saying is, we as a country have three choices. Remember I said a big source of economic growth is population growth. We're having fewer kids than we used to. So we have three choices, and this is just math. Number one, we can accept slower growth. Doesn't sound very good to me, but we can accept slower growth. Number two, we can try to subsidize fertility to have more babies. Not everyone laughs when I say it, but you can try. It's pretty darn expensive. Or number three, we can embrace immigration to get our population growth rate back up. That's it. Those are your three choices. Accept slower growth, subsidize fertility, or embrace immigration. Now it's up to the American people to decide which of those three that we want to have happen. And we should look to Japan and Kuroda and other countries to realize if we don't make choices, the math will overwhelm us. Okay, we have another question over here. So the uh, economic... Pro uh, Where are you? Sorry, right I don't here. see you. Yeah. Oh, hi there. The uh, economic projections came out like a week or two ago and it showed the uh, long-term uh, Fed funds rate median was from 3% shifted down to 2.7. Uh, I don't want you to speculate what your other board members were, uh, or the thought process behind it, but what do you see as the reason for that you know, 25 basis point downward shift? So this is, um, this is related to what I was just talking about. So with, with the Federal Reserve, what central banks are doing is we're adjusting interest rates up and down around a long-term trend. But since around 1980, that trend has been gradually drifting lower and lower, and the Fed has been adjusting interest rates around that trend. But that trend is set by the economy. It's not set by us. It's set by things like demographic factors, the aging of society. It's set by things like technology development and productivity growth, what we call the real economy, 
as opposed to monetary policy. So what's happening is, over the last several years, central bankers and the markets have been appreciating that the real interest rate, the neutral rate that balances savings and investment in the economy is lower than we realized. And it's lower because productivity growth has been low. It's lower because uh, population has been aging and population growth has been slowing. So we've all been coming to grips with that reality and adjusting our forecast. So when you look and you say, gee, why are interest rates in America so low today versus 30 years ago? It's only a little bit because of the Fed. A lot of it is because our society has been changing just because of the way all of us are living our lives and the technologies we've been developing and the way we've been investing. And so, I mean, I know it's a complicated concept, but that ultimately is what's underlying the, the slow reduction in interest rates. Question here. Do you feel the uh, Dodd-Frank has overcorrected the current banking situation where it's for small banks that can't afford compliance officers, so it's less banks and more bigger banks who are kind of getting in the same thing we were before 08 crisis? And, and if so, what would you do? Yeah, so this is, uh, you're exactly right. And in fact, if you, if you look at the draft plan that we released on Too Big to Fail, it actually has a few different components. One component is making sure the biggest banks are no longer too big to fail. The other component is relaxing regulations on community banks that were not part of the crisis, that are not systemically risky, and are not going to bring down the US economy. And you're exactly right. Dodd-Frank, which was trying to solve too big to fail, in some ways made the problem worse because it gave more advantages to the biggest banks who could afford to hire those extra compliance officers. So I agree completely with the spirit of your question. And we're going to be soon coming out with our final version of the Minneapolis plan which will go into more detail on how we want to relax some of the regulations on community banks in the US. You know, in a healthy economy, you're going to have new firms created, and you're going to have some firms fail. In America, there should be some small banks that are failing as evidence of a market economy that is working. We don't want a lot of small banks failing, but it's evidence that some failures is an evidence that firms are taking risks, and risk some risk is appropriate. And so getting that Getting that balance right, we think, is very important. And so what you just said is actually part of the plan that we've put out, that we are putting out, to try to rationalize the banking sector while solving the too-big-to-fail problem at the same time. Looking for other questions? If so, raise your hands. OK, go ahead. And we have another question over here. Sir? Go ahead. I have a question about inflation. About we what? Have, we have $19 trillion of debt debt in general in nations where this much debt is there there is inflation but in u.s there is no inflation so in my opinion what is going on is that if you have to have one billion dollar of deficit then in the printing press in dc you print two billion dollars and out of those two billion dollars, one, do one billion you send it to China or somewhere else, buy the goods. Other billion dollars you circulate in the US. So those billion dollars of goods and this one billion dollar of money which we printed balance out and there is no inflation. Am I right? Uh, no, but I, I like the theory. Um, <laughs> The reason we have low inflation with as much debt as we have is because investors around the world still believe the US economy is the strongest, most robust economy in the world. And investors would rather buy US government debt than anybody else's debt because they view it as being safe for the long term. Now, this can't go on forever. Right? The best thing we have going for us is that we are relatively stronger than Europe, than China, than Japan, than the United Kingdom. But imagine, in the next five or 10 years, if Europe really comes together and gets their fiscal house in order, now there might be another place for investors to put their money rather than the US. So right now, we have a little bit of time. But what we really need to do is deal with our long-term economic issues, such as our long-term entitlement programs, which are forecasted to go up and up and up. And they're closely related to the demographic challenges that I talked about. Those programs are funded by current workers paying for current retirees. As that gets more and more imbalanced, 
investors will then start to question their solvency, the solvency of the United States of America, and that's when you would expect to see inflation come. So it's not as nefarious as you imply, but we don't have forever to deal with this. We do have to put our fiscal house in order before investors choose to invest somewhere else. Okay, we have one more question over here, if we can bring a mic over here. Uh, and intriguingly, if you understand in economics, there's the fiscal measures and the monetary measures. Fiscal measures oftentimes require politicians to agree on something, and that hasn't been happening recently in case any, I don't know if it's a big surprise to <laughs> people in the room, but has put a huge burden on the monetary side to try to offset, and so uh, monetary can't escape, so it has to deal with the demographic issues. It has to deal with the unaddressed fiscal issues, and I think that's part of the reason why the role of, of the Fed and other central banks has become so important, because they can't just ignore the issues as so many people have done in other areas of the economy. Go ahead. So let's go back to 2008. Uh, you're a young man today. You were a really young man then. Um, but I'd like to hear a little bit about what was keeping you focused personally as, I mean, there were a lot of crazy things going on. There were a lot of crazy meetings that were happening. Talk a little bit, if you can, give us some of your insights as to the things you did to be able to stay focused and be able to, to see the problem at hand and go about solving some of the things that needed to be addressed. Sure. Uh, it felt like the financial crisis felt like we were at war. And it went on for month after month, year. I mean, it was more than a year. And we just couldn't believe. We kept thinking, OK, the worst is behind us. It's now we've hit bottom. It's going to turn around. And it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And we kept feeling like if we fail, we are going to be in a Great Depression scenario. And that's unbelievably fo that focuses the mind. Uh, I was part of a, a team that I'm very proud to be associated with, of, of people who are totally non-political, just focus on trying to get the country through this. I give uh, then Fed Chair Ben Bernanke, my boss Hank Paulson, uh, Tim Geithner a lot of credit because their, their motto was the, the downside of failure is so catastrophic for the American people. Let's try everything we can possibly think of, recognizing not everything's going to work. But we'd rather fail trying everything than not trying enough. And thankfully, the collective actions did work. In the worst moments of the $700 billion TARP program that I was in charge of, in the worst moments, I did not think we would get a single dollar back. The fact that we got basically it all back uh, and the banking program actually made a profit for the taxpayers is a miracle that we had not forecast at the time. But, you know, good to be lucky in a sense. And so I learned about myself that I was able to think clearly in the middle of the night under a lot of pressure. Uh, but I had a lot of really good people with me, and we were just doing whatever we could to get through it. And so nothing I will ever do will compare to the stress that we felt during that, and I'm happy to not have to face that again. The uh, Economic Club of Minnesota was pleased to have Ben Bernanke as one of our speakers. They asked him about the movie on that period, and he says, I saw the original, I skipped the movie. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty dramatic uh, period, and it, the actions taken then, although 90% unpopular, uh, certain actions, uh, who you have at the helm makes a difference. So right now, we're going to be picking a new or reappointing an existing uh, Fed chair. Uh, the President Trump is, will be making that announcement sometime in the next several months. There's a couple of candidates. But if you could maybe g give us some thoughts about what, how we ought to look at those candidates and what, what attributes, what skills, what strengths does the next period of time tell us we need in a Fed chair? Well, I'll just say this. I've said it. Um, I think Janet Yellen is doing an excellent job, and I really hope she gets reappointed. Uh, I cannot think of anybody who is better equipped to lead the Federal Reserve for the next four years than her. Uh, there's nobody else who has 20 plus years of monetary policy experience, financial crisis experience. She's the rare economist with excellent leadership skills. Uh, she really does. Uh, you know, she leads. She doesn't just lead the Board of Governors. She leads the Federal Reserve system, and she d has really earned the trust and respect of all of her colleagues. So. Uh, I think she'd be a terrific reappointment. Um, to me, I think I look for somebody with that kind of experience. You know, monetary policy is a very complicated topic. I have learned a lot uh, in my first couple of years at the Federal Reserve. Uh, 
having her at the helm with 20 plus years of experience, uh, you can't find anybody else like that. And so I think we're very lucky and I, I hope she gets reappointed. Questions, other questions we have out there. Uh, over here, let's bring a, a mic. It's interesting, as I travel around the world, I think many around the world spend more time focused on our Federal Reserve than Americans spend on their Federal Reserve. One of the things that I, I say that I enjoy is what they complain to me about. And I was teaching a group of executive MBAs in Qatar, in Doha, and they were complaining to me about Federal Reserve policy <laughs> because it was too loose and a dollar was going down and they sell their oil in dollar denominations and they invest in dollars. So what happens here does impact not just Grand Forks, but has a huge impact in the world. We had a question here? Yes, um, actually it's related to what you're just talking about. Is the, is the Federal Reserve, you know, decreases its balance sheet and longer term rates rise, um, and you're rising short term rates in addition, what's gonna happen to our commodity prices? I mean, how much of an effect does the long term rates enter into the prices like you just described? I know short term rates are pretty important. Well, um, I gotta tell you, predicting commodity prices is not something that I, I would claim to be very good at. And I don't know anybody, Frank, maybe you are, but I don't know many people who, who are. We've been looking out for, uh, I'm not trying to dodge your question, it's just we've been looking out for financial shocks since the Great Recession. And I gotta tell you, nobody I know predicted oil going from 30 to 140, back down to 30, now back up to 50. Those are huge swings and have a huge effect on the global economy and the US economy and, and certainly North Dakota. So to say what monetary policy is gonna to do to that, I don't know, other than saying if we lower interest rates and make borrowing costs lower, it's on the margin should be easier, less expensive for developers to then go in and explore commodities. So just that little relationship would suggest lower interest rates will lead to more investment, which would probably lead to lower prices then for the commodity because there's more supply coming online. But I know it's way more complicated than that when you think about global markets and you think about various different commodities. We do certainly pay attention to commodity prices. We do pay attention to currencies and the feedback loop on the US economy. But I certainly am not making interest rate recommendations based on what I think it's gonna do to this commodity or that commodity. I try to assess what it's gonna mean for the US economy as a whole. Other questions, raise your hand. Uh, let me just, while we're getting the next question, uh, you've recently started the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute to research the causes of economic inequality and underemployment uh, and, and perhaps how the Fed can help. I'm, how do you see that going? What are you learning? What lessons are there for the broader Fed? One of the, my surprises coming to this region, so I was born and raised in Ohio, so coming to Minnesota, coming to the Midwest feels, feels a lot like home. But one of the things that surprised me about our region is the extent of the disparities across the region. There are urban and rural disparities, there are racial disparities, and I started asking very basic questions about why these disparities exist, why are they so persistent, and I got very few good answers. So we decided to do something about it and to put the Federal Reserve's research power into, behind studying these problems, and that's what the new institute is, to try to understand what are the structural forces leading to these disparities and what are some policies that can help to close some of these gaps. Now we know, take education. Education is a huge driver of employment outcomes. People with more and better education have more and better job opportunities, generally earn more money. Especially if they graduate from the University of North Dakota. Especially Dakotas. from UND, <laughs> especially in the last year with the new leadership. Um, but we're not the Department of Education, so we can't directly control education policy. But if we can do the research in a nonpartisan, nonpolitical way, present our findings to other, to elected leaders, state legislators or the federal legislators, then perhaps they can take that analysis forward. And so we feel like we have a role to play. That's on the research and analysis side, and that's what we're gonna do. But this is, these are decades or longer in the making of these problems. We're not gonna come up with an answer overnight. Great, um, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Kachari, for being here. Uh, it's Thank an honor you. to have you. I'm curious to get your perspective because in North Dakota, we're in a unique spot with having a state bank. Um, it's something that has allowed students to get low interest rates on their student loans. Um, I think I moved mine from 8% at the federal level down to something like 2%, saving hundreds of dollars a month. Uh, farmers can get low rates, uh, small business owners. And it was created sort of by this progressive populist movement uh, in the earliest part of, of the last century. 
And uh, you know, some would say there's some benefits and some downsides, um, but I'm just curious to get your perspective. Do you think it's something that could be emulated elsewhere? Do you think there is something that is maybe only unique to North Dakota? Um, just thought I'd uh, see what you had to say. Thanks. Well, I think it's something that you know, other states could certainly consider. Um, and I, as you said, there are benefits in terms of potentially lower cost financing for those who are getting the loans, but there's also risk for the taxpayers if those loans aren't paid back. And so I, to me, that's a decision that states should make for themselves uh, rather than me advocating one way or the other. Some people have advocated, for example, for the United States to have an infrastructure bank to go try to finance infrastructure. Well, to them I ask, how is that different than the US Treasury just issuing Treasury bonds at record low rates and then funding the Department of Transportation to go fund infrastructure? It isn't obvious to me why an infrastructure bank is superior to the Treasury markets. Uh, so you know there are pros and cons. And the answer to that usually is, well, the infrastructure bank would have uh, project expertise to assess projects. Again, I don't know why the Department of Transportation wouldn't have that expertise. So I think there are pros and cons associated with these, and reasonable people can take different positions on this. It, is, there isn't, a, it isn't a no brainer either way from my perspective. Uh, Other questions? Yeah. Just a quick one. Uh, with Good. respect to student loans, um, maybe you can give us a perspective what's actually real and what's uh, more scare tactics, right? Because we hear all, uh, all about it in the media, uh, but what is your perspective on the student loan situation? Well, I mean, the data that I've looked at says student loan volumes have increased dramatically in the last 10 years, and they are a, an enormous burden for students, obviously, who have those loans. When I went to business school uh, to get my MBA, I took out about $100,000 in loans to p pay for business school, which is a you know, pretty scary thing to do when you're young and you, I quit my job as an engineer, took out $100,000 in debt. Boy, I hope it worked, you know, I was really hoping it worked out, and it did. I've been able to pay off my debts, but that's a heck, heck of a burden to, uh, to bear. And so I think it is concerning for all of us. In our, in our society, in this new economy that we're in, skills are never more important, right? Every year, the skills you have become more and more and more important. So education becomes more important. More years of schooling becomes more important. So I think we have to look for ways of providing more education at lower cost to meet the needs of our students. And I think we need to give students as much information as possible so that they can be smart consumers and recognize if they're taking on this debt, hopefully they're studying something that has some hope of being able to get a pretty good job to be able to pay off that debt. Students need to take some responsibility for themselves too. Uh, and so you need to look at what are you majoring? Are there jobs available in those fields? There are no guarantees but at least give yourself a shot of being able to pay back those loans. I mean, despite the fact that college costs have gone up, the return to uh, college has, n has never been higher. So the burdens are high, but the returns are high, but students also need to be informed consumers at the same time. I wanted to continue on the infrastructure question and asking not from a political standpoint, but from an economic standpoint, given the low cost of money, and the potential slack in the labor market, wouldn't infrastructure spending make sense now? So now, relative to other times, yes. The question is, it is going to be politics, though. What projects do you finance? So you're right, record low, almost record low borrowing costs. If not now, then when? But you know, usually people talk about airports. And I got to tell you, I've lived all over this country, born in Ohio, school in Illinois, California most of my adult life, Washington, DC. Uh, now Minnesota, I've always lived 45 minutes or less, maybe to an hour away from a decent airport where I could fly anywhere in the world I needed to, maybe with a connection or not. But I gotta tell you, if we had more palatial airports, I don't believe our GDP growth would be any higher. And people like to say, well, have you seen Shanghai's airport? It's like a palace. Okay, that's fine, but is our, is our economy gonna grow faster if we had palatial airports? I don't buy it. I drove to Minnesota when my wife and I moved from California. You know what, the roads were okay. There were a few potholes along the way, but the idea that our highway system was a huge barrier to commerce, again, I haven't experienced that. Now, is there water infrastructure? Is there other infrastructure that we need? Very possibly, but so to me the question is not, is now the time to invest in infrastructure? The hard question is, which infrastructure are you actually investing in? I don't believe palatial airports, which a lot of people point to, is going to make our economy grow any faster. Other questions? I know we have one in the back there. 
My question relates to uh, consumer goods in particular. When I buy things, quite often I see that they're made in China, and I know that uh, both China and the USSR or the, so, uh, Russia went different paths. Why can't I buy anything made in Russia and yet everything is made in China when both are centrally planned economies? Boy, that's a good question. Um, I just, our former board member's been to Russia, I just learned 84 times, so maybe I could turn the question <laughs> over to him. Um, I, one of the factors, I think, is just the huge population of China and people moving from the farm economy into the cities with very, very low uh, relative wages. And that's a you know, relative price uh, advantage that China, I believe, has over Russia and certainly over the United States. And that's, that, by the way, that is one theory for why inflation in advanced economies is so low, that this big labor supply is moving into the global economy from Chinese agriculture sectors into the Chinese industrialization. So my best guess is, I'm not an expert on, on Russia, certainly, my best guess is they have a price advantage in terms of labor uh, relative to Russia. But I don't know, I'm looking at Howard, what do you think? I, I will <coughs> say, is there a mic? Can we bring a mic up front? I mean, I, there's so much corruption still in Russia. If you look at Poland, Ukraine, same per capita GDP in 1991. Today, Poland's five times per capita GDP. You just have to look at the question of corruption and the rule of law. And at least in China, Deng Xiaoping did bring contracts were enforced or a lot of uh, basic stuff like that, but Russia's still a mess. Although it's a great place to do business. But I, I do have one question. All right. Being audit chair of the Fed and sitting in a room with Deloitte and Touche and seeing protesters outside saying, audit the Fed, could you help, help the audience understand what Ron Paul and others are saying sure. when they say audit the Fed because the Fed is audited? Yeah. So what are they really saying? Sure. Well, thanks for the question. So uh, as Howard said, the Federal Reserve is audited every year. All of our, our balance sheet is audited. All of our transactions are audited. If you go to federalreserve.gov, right on the homepage, you will see a button to read our audit. And if you've got hours and hours and hours to kill and you can't sleep at night, I am, urge you to go there and click on the audit, read the audit button. So the critics are, are saying they don't like the fact that we have independent monetary policy. That's really what this is about. They want to get their fingers into Fed decision making on what we do with interest rates because the Fed's monetary policy decisions are shielded so that we have, are protected from political influence. That's what they want to get at. And that's where they're saying, well, we want to go audit those monetary policy decisions. By the way, when we meet, we release minutes of our meetings after a few weeks after every meeting. And then five years later, a transcript, word for word, is released to the public. The reason there's a five-year delay is to try to shield us from any political concerns. Maybe politicians won't like the decisions we're making. We get to shield ourselves from that a little bit with this delay but all of it is on the record. All of that is recorded for the American people to see in the future. Thanks for the question. Other questions? And uh, getting back to that popularity of decisions, if there were popular solutions to any of the problems we face now, the politicians would have already done them. So most of the right answers to the challenges we face are unpopular, which is part of going back to the second question I asked you, why is the Fed independent? Uh, and uh, the, the audit the Fed movement is an attack against Fed independence, which I think if you study economics, you will find has shown to been a value. And there are multiple countries with Federal Reserve's equivalents that have multiple degrees of independence, so this is a good academic study to the extent somebody's looking for a good research paper out there. Questions? Go ahead. So first off, I'd like to thank you so much for coming here. I think for your very good experience. And part of that experience is not only on the Federal Reserve, but also for running for office. I was wondering what kind of examples or what kind of lessons you're taught by running for office for governor and how that applies to your job today. Sure. Well, I ran for governor of California for the exact same reason I jumped at the chance to join the Federal Reserve, which is I care deeply about public policy. Good public policy makes a huge difference in the, in the direction and the future of countries. I, I always say, if you want to help a 1,000 people, donate to a charity. 
you can really make a difference. If you want to help a million people, or 10 million people, or 100 million people, the only way you can do that is by improving public policy. So my platform for my campaign when I ran was purely an economic platform. It was literally, my slogan was jobs and education, that's it. Because my view was if you have a strong job market and people get good education, most of the other problems in society take care of themselves. And so coming to the Federal Reserve is a different way than being an elected leader, but it's a different way to engage in really important economic issues and advocate for what I believe is sound economic policy. So I learned a lot. You know, when I ran, I mean, Mark is, I ran once and I lost. Mark has actually won elections. Um, so we should turn the question to him. But, you know, I met the widest range of people imaginable. Everything from literally billionaires to homeless people and everything, everyone in between. And what I found is the vast majority of people are good. The vast majority of people want to help one another succeed and have a better life and a better future for themselves and their families. And if you're working with a group of people who have that same, those same common interests, boy, you can, you can overcome a lot of challenges and a lot of obstacles. So even though I lost my race, I left with great optimism about the process, about what I learned, and about the role that policy has in economies. I don't know, would you add anything, Mark? Uh, I could give another lecture on that, maybe <laughs> on, a, on a different day, but uh, I would uh, uh, also encourage people to get involved in public service, whether it be appointed, whether it be elected, whether it be the school board, whether it be serving in the military, there are many ways to serve, and it is a very satisfying result when you start to get a little gray hair to have done so. Uh, other questions we have out there? Uh, thank you. Oh, where are you? Oh, there you are. Um, it seems that your predecessor at the Minneapolis Fed, um, uh, President Coker Lakota, became more dovish over time. And you mentioned earlier that you were uh, more dovish relative to your, to your peers. Uh, is that a coincidence, or is there something about the research team at the Minneapolis Fed? And uh, maybe to help the economic students here, what is the role of economists at the, at the regional Federal Reserve banks? And, and let me just insert, uh, if you could explain, dovish versus hawkish in the context of monetary policy. Sure. So uh, people on Twitter, when you started tweeting about this event, said it's very ironic that I'm speaking at the Eye of the Hawk lecture series because I'm considered <laughs> to be a monetary dove. Dove means somebody who wants lower rates. Hawk means somebody who wants higher rates to try to keep inflation in check. So my predecessor, Nariana Kocha Lakota, also had a similar perspective on monetary policy than I have. And I think it's somewhat of a coincidence. Uh, we have a very strong research department at the Minneapolis Fed of excellent PhD economists. Uh, I would argue humbly that we have the best research department in the Federal Reserve System. And I give, I give them this, they are independent thinkers. And maybe that's what we're benefiting from, is that they are not afraid to challenge the status quo. They're not afraid to challenge conventional wisdom. And I learn a lot from them. We work together a lot, looking at data, challenging each other, uh, learning from each other. And then ultimately, I make my own call on looking at the data, talking to my economists, assessing the various trade-offs. I make my own call. And so I think Nariana, my predecessor, you know, made his own decisions and for his own reasons. Uh, but I think we, d we both benefited from the fact that we have such a strong independent research department at the Minneapolis Fed. It really is one of the jewels of the system. Other questions? Hi, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, my question is in reference to uh, 2008 and the Too Big to Fail uh, programs, one of which was physically claiming, for lack of a better term, companies like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And in DC recently, there's been some discussion as to releasing these companies back out onto the uh, open market without as much regulation and control as there has been. Do you think, from an economic standpoint, this is feasible? Is this, is this the time to do that? Is there ever a time to release them? Thank you. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's feasible, but the question is whether it's a good idea for the taxpayers or not. So Fannie and Freddie were created by Congress to support mortgage lending around the country. But they created this curious structure where the profit, you know, when the, when the Federal Reserve makes profits, 100% of the profits of the Federal Reserve go to the taxpayers. 100% every year go to the taxpayers because we are, work on behalf of the taxpayers. When Fannie and Freddie made profits, their profits went to their private shareholders. But if Fannie and Freddie got into trouble, 
the US government had to stand behind them. So the taxpayers took the downside, the private shareholders took the upside. So what the Treasury Department did when I was there, when they ran into the ditch, because they underwrote mortgages that went bad, the US Treasury seized them, took them over, and said all of your profits in the future are gonna to go to the taxpayers. If, we're, if the taxpayers are gonna stand behind you in the bad times, we're gonna make sure that they have the upside in the good times. Well, that's been, they've been in that situation now for almost 10 years, and the question is, what's their future going to be? And that's for Congress and the administration to decide, do they wanna give private sector profits again? Do they wanna fully nationalize them? Do they wanna wind them down? That ultimately is a political call, but I'll just tell you, I don't think the private sector shareholders getting the upside and the taxpayers getting the downside is a very good idea. It didn't serve us well going into 2008 and it won't serve us well in the future. And if you wanna get into arcane, uh, you know, things which Fannie and Freddie starts to get you in that slope, different segments of the economy have different views of that. Generally home builders like a loose Fannie and Freddie because that means lower rates for mortgages which means more people building homes. Uh, but then uh, the banks are saying, well, why do you have a federal entity competing with me? So none of these issues which we get back to have the same people with the same views and there's different competing interests that are, that are playing out on all of these. Other questions we have out there? Thank well, you again for a, coming to speak. To, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you again for coming to uh, speak to us. Um, one trend that we see happening with labor markets is this increasing trend of automation. So one um, case in point is the uh, trend that we we're seeing towards research in self-driving vehicles that could entirely put a whole industry out of business in a matter of a decade or two. Given the Fed's mandate for full unemployment, what challenges do you see for the Fed in light of this increasing trend towards, excuse me, towards automation? You know, I'm not sure if the trend is increasing or not. We hear lots of anecdotes, and certainly self-driving cars have the potential to be transformational and very disruptive, especially if you're a truck driver or a cab driver, no question. But the history of our economy is one of transformation through innovation. You know, when I look at, in the last decade, what's the most important innovation in the U.S. economy? It's not Facebook or Twitter, it's fracking. It has had a much more profound impact on the U.S. and the global economy than anything out of Silicon Valley. And it doesn't get the credit it deserves for that, that type of transformational effect. So who knows what the future holds? I'll tell you this, one of the conundrums in economics today is why productivity growth is so low. If you look at the official statistics, productivity growth is a fraction of where it was 20 years ago and even lower than where it was 30 or 40 years ago. And we're not exactly sure why. Some people argue things like Facebook and Twitter just don't move the needle. They're just not that innovative compared to things like the integrated circuit or the internal combustion engine or airplanes, et cetera. So we definitely need more innovation in the US economy. It definitely will be disruptive for those who are immediately affected by it. But the US economy has survived waves of innovation in the past. I'm confident we will survive them in the future. I am not a believer in the notion that robots are coming and we're all gonna be unemployed because of robots. Let me give you an example. Skynet, if you, if you ever saw the original Terminator movie, Skynet was supposed to become self-aware in 1997. It's now 2017, we're no closer to Skynet. I'm not that worried. I think the reason we're less productive is because we're spending so much time on the- It uh, could be, it could be. <laughs> Machines are doing uh, all of those uh, social media. Uh, other questions we have out here. Hi, um, so I was just curious how you balance uh, market deregulation and market efficiency with your views on climate change. Say that again? <laughs> I wanna make sure I understand the question. Uh, how do you balance market efficiency and market deregulation with your views that climate change is man-made and uh, a real threat to the world? Well, um, you know, when the majority of scientists of a given field tell me something, I think we should take that seriously. And so I, think, I take it seriously that the majority of scientists uh, have made the link between uh, human activity and long-term climate change. The harder part from my, from my perspective is what we do about it. I have not seen good policy solutions that seem like uh, 
they have reasonable cost-benefit trade-offs in terms of how to address it. I don't think it's as simple as slapping a carbon tax on society and then magically everything works out and uh, we stop the earth uh, from, from warming. And so this is an area where, you know, again, I believe in science, but I also think we need to do a lot more work in looking for credible solutions. And so how do I balance it? If I go back to too big to fail, we have to assess risk. We have to look at a range of solutions. We have to look at what the cost of those solutions are and look at it from a cost-benefit analysis and make the best case we possibly can uh, dealing with imperfect information. You know, across a whole range of issues, we assess risk every day as a country. Think about terrorism, the risk of terrorism. We can never eliminate the risk of terrorism. And each of you knows this. You can never make the risk zero. And with increased safety comes increased costs. So you go to the airport, you have to go through a metal detector. There's a cost associated with safety. And those metal detectors are not perfect. You know, they could hand search every bag and we would be safer, but the cost would be astronomical. So we as a society decide how much safety we are willing to pay for. That's true in financial stability. That's true in physical security. I think that's probably true in climate security too. So to me, we need to take the risk very seriously and we need to look for the best trade-offs in terms of costs and benefits and safety and costs. And th that's how I would think through it. But I don't have a better answer than that right now. Other questions? Go ahead. Uh, Neil, let's say there's a hypothetical state out there that has no debt and they hypothetically tax one industry really, really heavy, let's say hypothetically oil. And let's say they put a third of it away and suddenly they have a pot of money that's equal to their budget and soon to be twice their budget. What, if you were a king for a day, what advice would you give to this hypothetical <laughs> state? <laughs> besides, besides invest some of it in the University of North Dakota. <laughs> Well, again, I think it comes back to uh, we have finite resources and we have to decide, you know, what are our priorities as a society? Any society has to decide, whether it's defense, health care for its citizens, education for its young people, investing in R&D, et cetera. I think over the long term, societies are better off when they have productivity growth is the, is the key to the future of societies. And productivity growth comes from having a more skilled workforce, so education is enormously important, and breakthroughs in technology development, basic research. I'm not talking about commercialization. I think you can leave that to the private sector, but there is a role for government funding basic research. And so to me, at a very you know, macro level, I think investing in people's skill development is enormously important, and funding basic research, I also think, leads to better outcomes long-term for society. But each state has its own customized needs each country does. That's, those are macro comments that I would make. And I know just the perfect place for skill development and research, <laughs> in case you were wondering for a follow-up question. <laughs> <laughs> questions, other further questions out there? Okay, and one more here and one more there, and then I think we're probably getting towards the end of our yeah, time. The lady so, in the back has a mic. So get her a mic. Go ahead, Howard. Hi, um, so earlier you were talking about how um, we can analyze our economy and so one of the main factors that we um, analyze is the proportion um, of immigrants that do contribute to our economy. So earlier we were talking about how um, our economy has shown not rapid growth. Um, so the three solutions that you um, brought to us were to accept the fact that we have a slower growing economy um, to increase um, birth rates or to increase immigration. Um, so one of the topics that comes to mind for me is programs such as DACA, Dreamers Act, and the Bridge Act. Do you think that as we take away these programs, our economy will result in a slower growth or result in to being more efficient? Thank well, you. I think, um, I mean, the math is clear. If we have less immigration, all things being equal, we're going to have slower economic growth. And, but I do think, as a country, we can decide to design an immigration program that meets the needs of our economy. And so I think that that's sensible policy and that we as a, the American people should have that debate and decide what kind of immigration program do we want to have, where do we want to prioritize certain skills to meet the needs of our economy. Some other countries do that, I think, very effectively. And, you know, in full disclosure, I'm the son of immigrants. I'm married to an immigrant. Uh, I, I've certainly seen the benefits personally of, 
being able, my family being able to come to the US, but I also recognize coming to the United States is a privilege, not a right. And so I think the country has to decide what immigration system we want to have that meets our needs as a country, and then go out. You know, immigration, it's a war, not a war, it's a competition for talent around the world. And this is a competition the United States of America can win over and over and over again because immigrants want to come here. We do a much better job than almost any other country of welcoming immigrants into our society, and I'm a great example of that. The fact that I'm the son of immigrants getting to have the kind of role that I have, this is a truly great country. So yeah, we need to get our, you know, get some consensus around what our immigration system can look like, should look like, and it can be a continued source of economic competitiveness for our country. And I think uh, one of the most interesting things, having been in many parts of the world, there are some people that feel very frustrated and constrained. They don't live in countries as open and uh, accepting of taking risk and failing and trying again and letting different people uh, have different ideas as America. And some of them are very bright, very innovative, very hardworking. And they want to go someplace where they can shine. And they're wandering around the world figuring out where can I bring my talents that's going to create the next innovative product that will employ lots of people and keep us at the forefront. And they're looking for a place to be. And if we don't embrace and accept those, beyond just the sheer numbers side Absolutely. of it, the innovation side of it, we wouldn't have Silicon Valley today if it were not that we were the most open economy on the planet. So it's a, it is a big economic issue, and I don't think we've done enough exploring what are the economic impacts of immigration policy. Couldn't so we have more. two more questions. We'll take the one in the back, and then we'll end with Howard. <coughs> Um, uh, I got a simple question, I guess. Should we keep minting the penny or should we quit making the penny? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, during the financial crisis, a buddy of mine used to always call me up and say, I was at Treasury, have you gotten rid of the penny yet? That was like his mission that he gave me. I got to tell you, uh, I may not like carrying around pennies, but I'm a big fan of Abraham Lincoln, and so we got to find somewhere else to put Abraham Lincoln <laughs> if we're going to get rid of the penny. Go ahead, Howard. Sorry. Nariana's predecessor, Gary Stern, in his very last meeting at the Fed, and he and Ron Feldman had written this book, Too Big to Fail. And we asked Gary if he'd been in New York or Boston or at the Fed in DC, if he'd have been listened to. And so when your plan for the Minneapolis plan, uh, Gary felt that he was not listened to seriously enough because he was from Minneapolis. Do you have any sense of what you're working on right now? Well, um, certainly the regulatory winds in the country are blowing against us right now. There's a deregulatory wind that's blowing, and we're advocating for more regulation just for the biggest banks that are still too big to fail. I got to tell you, I meet with a lot of members of Congress, Republican and Democrat, House and Senate, and it's almost unanimous when I say to them, don't kid yourself, the biggest banks in America are still too big to fail. They all say, we know. You're right. We agree. And then I say, and we need to relax regulations on community banks at the same time. And the vast majority agree with that, too. So I mean, just because members of Congress and the Senate and the House all agree doesn't mean something's going to happen, <laughs> right? But I'm at least hopeful that on both sides of the aisle, people basically agree with these two concepts. And we're going to keep pushing, and we're going to keep pushing, and uh, you never know. You know, in, in our society, it seems like nothing happens until something lines up, and then everything happens. And so you never know what's going to what's going to take place, and we're going to keep advocating and keep fighting. At the end of the day, our jobs are to identify risks, to call them out, and to propose sensible solutions. And that's what we're doing. And we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we weren't speaking out. So we're going to keep speaking out whether or not uh, we make immediate progress or it's a longer term effort. Well, let me just say that uh, why this is so important to what price you're paying and whether you get a job is this whole process of banks lending money to entrepreneurs to go out and grow the economy so they can employ you.
has got finely delicate balance, enough regulation, not enough regulation, enough money supply, not enough money supply, that is impossible to do right all the time, requires a lot of wisdom and discernment, and uh, having informed citizens, which we appreciate you taking time today to learn a bit more about monetary policy, and that's why I'm pleased that we were able to welcome uh, you here to the, econo to, the uh, to the University of North Dakota's uh, Eye of the Hawk series, and so you can burnish your hawk credentials uh, <laughs> as part of that scenario. So I know we have uh, some a little uh, present here from them. Oh, sure. Uh, on behalf of the College of Business, uh, Dean Light, and all the students who were here and, and really benefited from this, uh, thank you very much for attending. Thank and we you. just have a little token of our appreciation. Thank you thank very much. much. I really appreciate you having me. Thank you. 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 Th